Well, welcome to the Spirit Gathering Teleconference. Today is Tuesday, February 18, 2014. And my name is Nancy Rubin. And the topic of today's call is Hidden Gifts in Adversity. And we're so glad you could all join us here tonight. We are recording the call so that people who could not be here tonight can listen in. Please press either your phone's mute button or star six to mute the line, and this helps keep the line quiet. So we're going to take a moment now to get centered, to settle in, to let go of the events of the day, and to begin to enter a deeper sacred space within ourselves and within the circle of those who have gathered together this evening. Now let us imagine that we are joining together sacred heart to sacred heart with every other person on this call right now. And now let us imagine that we are joining together in a circle with a light or flame or fire in the center. Imagine a spoke of light coming from the center of the circle to your heart. And for each person on the call tonight, or for those listening in after. Now we are connected sacred heart to sacred heart. Now let us set our intentions. We listen to one another with compassion and curiosity. We ask for what we need and offer what we can. We deepen our connection with one another and the divine. May this sharing serve us, our communities, and the planet. And so it is. Well, I came to this spirit gathering tonight to facilitate it tonight from a rather circuitous route. I had had an injury a couple of months ago, about two months ago, and It was not a serious one, but it was enough to change my life in many ways. And one of the ways in which it changed my life is that I had decided not to take on any extracurricular activities for several months because I was told it would take at least two or three months to heal. So that was just about the time that Amy sent out the call for people to sign up for facilitating spirit conferences by the month for the coming year. And I inadvertently typed in February. And several days later, when I realized that that was in a few weeks, I panicked. I had no idea why I had done that, but I figured it must be a sign. And I told Amy that I would let her know if I was really available to this and explained why. So in the beginning of February, I gave a distance group energy healing, which I do on the first Wednesday of every month. And there's usually guidance that comes through with the theme for all that tune in, both those in person and also those taking it at a distance. And the theme that came through was gratitude and the hidden gifts in adversity. So when Amy got back in touch with me just a few days ago, actually, to see whether or not I was really going to do this, I figured between the guidance that came out and how my life was such a an example of this, gratitude and and realization of gifts that I would do it. So here I am and I'm actually going to start 
this discussion by reading the guidance that came through this month, February 2014. Gratitude is an energy that exists within the unified field of greater consciousness at a frequency similar to that of light and unconditional love. It is therefore available for you to resonate with at all times. Since you are a hologram of the cosmos itself, you will be able to find gratitude within your own energy field, within your own being. All you need is the intention and willingness to look within for what is already there, for the gifts that exist within the whole. Most people become thankful only when something good has happened to them or to someone they love. Yet, because gratitude is an inclusive energy, it consists both of both the light and the dark. Just as the yin and yang are two opposites contained within the one known as the Tao, the qualities of thankfulness, relief, and appreciation coexist with challenge and adversity. You do not have to wait until everything is going your way to experience being grateful. You may find it in any situation. You have free will and thus choice about what to focus on. But how do you choose gratitude in the midst of struggle before you are actually feeling it? You do it from a place of internal knowing, a place of faith and radical trust in spirit and in self. This involves letting go of feeling like you have nothing to be thankful for, of letting go of feeling victimized, and of holding on to past injustices. This involves bravely and consciously looking for something to be thankful for, even if it is only your willingness to keep going. And therein lies the magic of choosing gratitude. You will be transformed by aligning yourself with the positive flow of energy in the universe. Spirit will assist you in shifting to a higher vibration, one of contentment and positivity. You will begin to experience the hidden gifts in what you had previously only experienced as adversity. Your expression of gratitude will be an energetic transmission of love and appreciation. In this way, you are sharing the light with others, and you are all uplifted. So I thought I would take a moment to just review a few of the the high points of this, that when we're looking for the gifts or when the gifts become known to us in the midst of adversity, there are several themes that come through. One is that it can be about choice that when you're in a difficult situation, out of all of the responses that are possible to that situation, a big one is gratitude and the ability to find a light in that situation, to find something to hold on to that moves you and brings you to a higher vibration. Another theme is allowing yourself to take responsibility for this that you get to choose how you handle it and how you spin it, how you see it and how you behave. Another one is that as you're weathering the adversity, there is something within you that allows you to join the natural flow of life, to move you on the energy waves of positivity and light and to be open to receive whatever gifts there might be. There is a Native American saying that says, give thanks for gifts already on their way. And it's a great statement of trust. And finally, and something that I think is the utmost important characteristic for healing, is 
taking the opportunity to identify what characteristics that you need to call up within yourself to get through a situation. Because these are the characteristics that will lead you to the gifts. And I thought that I would start off by just sharing three vignettes from my life, and then we'll open it up for others to share. These are, I think, three different takes on this theme, actually. And the first happened with a healing of a healing client of mine many years ago, who a young woman, really young, in her 20s, who came very, very sad and embittered with her life because she had been in a very big car accident and had been injured and had to quit her job and she lost her relationship, according to her, because of this and had been to see many doctors and uh, many alternative practitioners and seemed to be very miserable and continue to have pain mostly in her emotional body, more than her physical body. And as the hour moved along, I wasn't sure we were getting anywhere, and she was very, very attached to the bitterness. And so I took a leap of faith, just feeling intuitively that I might be able to say what I was going to say without victimizing her. And... So I went for it and I just asked very gently, is it possible that anything good came out of this situation, that there was any gift for you? And she thought about it and said, yes, I never would have left the job I was in if this hadn't happened to me and it was a bad job. And it was bad for me. And so we ended on that note. And then I never heard from her again for weeks. And I finally decided to call just to see how she was. And she said she didn't need to come back because that realization had made her turn a corner. And she was getting on with her life. That was a big lesson for me. And it changed the way that I actually saw adversity and gifts early on. And I want to share next a vignette about a friend of mine who was a teacher of voice and song in New York City and um, was from another country, Canada, actually. And uh, she lived a wonderful life in New York, had many friends, many students, and uh, gave many gifts through her song and her teaching, and was very happy with her situation. And all of a sudden, about four years ago, she was deported. No one knows how they found her, or even that she would have been found. But she had to leave the country despite numerous letters in her support, legal interventions. She had to leave. And she traveled to a few places to work on a book she was writing and uh, landed in her home country of Canada after about a year or two. And within a year after that, she developed a very serious cancer and um, one that was so rare that they didn't even have a protocol for it. She had to, they had to use a protocol that was for an organ similar and close to it. But what happened was, because she was in Canada at a place that she thought she might be isolated and far from her friends, her mother, who was her closest relative there, had just died she was really concerned about being isolated and alone. And what happened next was because of the healthcare system in Canada, she was taken to 
the second best hospital in the country with the Canadian leading expert in this particular type genre of cancers. And he was a wonderful, multidimensional healer. And she was given a social worker to follow her for five years and all sorts of aid that was available to her for free for the duration of her illness and recovery. So she found herself not having to pay a cent. And the first thing she thought of was that had she been in New York and experienced this illness or anywhere in the country, she would have been bankrupt and possibly not able to pay for her care and certainly not for any of the ancillary care. And she entered the state of grace filled with gratitude and and a leap in her faith and trust and became fully expanded and remains that way now in the midst of a very rigorous treatment. And so lastly, for my sharing, I wanted to talk about my own situation, which is not as extreme as the two that I mentioned, but it had a very momentous effect on my life. In mid-December, I was hiking in the snowy woods with my husband, and I my foot got caught on a hidden root or branch, and I fell over and broke my fall with my hand and broke a bone in my wrist, at least one bone in my wrist. And this was my dominant hand, so after thinking that this would be no problem at all, I soon realized after it was immobilized and I was told that it would need to be immobilized for two to three months that I couldn't do the things I normally could do. I couldn't, I could barely write and barely type to shower, change, do the dishes, clean, do just about anything it took three or four times as long. It was uncomfortable. And what I also found was that my mind was scrambled. Uh, I assume it was from the trauma of breaking a bone, but uh, I really just felt like sitting on the couch and watching television for the next three months. And so everything became more of an effort than it had before, than it had been before. And this was a big surprise for me. And what was interesting is that after I came out of the initial haze of discomfort and uh, having to spend a lot of time to do the most simple tasks, I started realizing that my life had been so full that I hadn't been taking time and being mindful of either the small or even large tasks that I was involved in. Not all of them, but certainly the most regular and the most mundane ones. And I had come into that month, which was essentially a vacation month for me from work, thinking that I would clear out my house and that I would clear out my mother's house and that I would do every single thing I had not gotten to do when I was busy working and that I would shop and play and see all my friends and I had a list of things. And my life didn't exactly ground to a halt, but it certainly was paused. And one by one, I gave up any intention of getting most of these things done and certainly of doing anything in the time frame that it normally took me to do. And that became a great gift. I was filled with gratitude for taking this time and for slowing down and for becoming more mindful of everything I was doing. And another gift was that I had noticed in the weeks prior to the injury that 
I had anger and resentment at home because I felt that my husband wasn't joining in with me in keeping it clean and uncluttered and in paying attention to what was needed there and what was needed in our relationship. And I realized that I had been angry at him on the day we were walking through the woods. And even walking down the hill, I thought, this is a dangerous day to walk. The snow is loose and wet, and he thinks it's fine, but it isn't fine. And why am I doing this? And a moment later, I tripped and fell. And what happened within weeks of this injury is I began to see what my role in these things that I was upset at him about was. I thought I was good at seeing this, but I had really passed this over. And I saw what my role was in the clutter in the house. And I realized that a lot of my frustration and anger was that I didn't have enough time to take care of the things that I wanted to take care of, both in the relationship and in the house. And I decided to let it go. And I let it go. I decided that I would just deal with what was going on and I would take the time to heal and to be in my highest. And I would forgive both him and myself. And that had magical results. And I believe it altered the way we related to each other. And so I became aware of what these hidden gifts were. More time, less busyness, more relaxation, more fun, better relationships, letting go of the things like the bills and the insurance and the dishes and the changing the sheets and cleaning the house at least what I could let go of, and to generously and harmoniously do the things that I couldn't let go of. And I changed my priorities. And if I were to follow the themes that I mentioned before and ask myself what were the characteristics that I had to look inside myself to develop or to emphasize in order to deal with the adversity, I would say that I had to accept my vulnerability on a whole new level, that I had to enter into humility in a way. I hadn't embraced it in my relationship with regard to certain things. I had to let go of a lot of expectation in my life of what I could get done, both the things that had to do with the house, with having fun, with traveling, to be okay with not getting things done. And I had to learn to compartmentalize and be all right with where I was and put things on hold, certain things on hold for a while and to be gentle with myself and calm throughout. Ultimately, I've come out of this feeling calmer and more empowered and living more like the person I know I am, but wasn't behaving in certain ways in that manner during the time prior to the injury. So I wanted to open this up now for discussion and hopefully for sharing. And I invite any of you who'd like to share any of your experiences with finding the hidden gifts and adversity in your own lives. Nancy, this is Deborah. Hi, Deborah. Hi. 
this is a great topic. It's coming at a great time for me because in August I signed a, kind of a co-creative contract with the universe and uh, asked for help with areas of my life that I felt weren't going very well and I had tried and not uh, been entirely successful with uh, making changes in those areas. So it was home, it was work, it was marriage. Uh, and so I signed this contract in August. In September, I was released from my job. And in October, uh, my husband told me he wanted a divorce. So I thought, wow, this universe is much more efficient than I ever would have been. Uh, and what I'm finding with, uh, with all areas of my life is incredible synchronicity. I, I never, I don't think I ever would have quit my job but I was working very long hours, and uh, it wasn't uh, giving me an opportunity for balance in my life. And when one of my customers heard this, she called and said, oh, my God, I can't believe it. You're such a wonderful salesperson, and you, uh, you're the hardest working rep I had. Why don't you come to work for me? And so I went to work for Mirafield Garden Center, the tagline, Where Beauty Begins. They're much more than a garden center. They do 20 themed, major themes at holiday time and 10 minor themes. It's one of the largest uh, gift shops in the area. And as if uh, being able to do all of the seasonal uh, celebrations and uh, ladies' nights and things like that weren't enough. They have a dog park in the back. So all day long, dogs and puppies are coming through. Uh, and uh, I am working with some of the – I have made so many new friends. It's like a, it's like a family there. And I am so – grateful that I can be in the midst of this this uh, beauty in every direction and uh, to be able to see the seasons change and the celebrations of the seasons and work with dear, what have become dear, dear friends, uh, customers. When customers come in, we just, uh, we talk as if it's a very special place. Uh, I've met some incredibly wonderful people, and uh, the assistant manager that I work with on a daily basis has just been going through a divorce with a similar uh, a similar personality uh, disorder with her husband. So we have become fast friends, and she has become quite quite um quite a nice resource for me. So I just I cannot imagine that I ever would have had this opportunity uh without the adversity that I had. And I am going to be approaching them about doing my uh seasonal seminars with uh with them. And uh, very excited about it. So, thank you. Thank you, Deborah. I'm going back on mute because my okay. doggy, doggy wants a treat. Nancy, this is Diane. Hi, Diane. Hi. Um, in April of 2011, 
we were called on a conference call at work um, because people were in different locations and we were given the news that this was um, everyone's last day of work and it was um, quite a shock and uh, has been, I can't believe it's almost three years, but it's been quite a path for me um, and I would say mostly it's about really digging deep to find my soul's work and what I am, where the alignment between myself and my soul is. And um, I've done a little bit of this and a little bit of that and um, am still in the search, but it feels closer and uh, definitely greater alignment and I'm really grateful for that and looking forward to um, securing Diane. work oh, I'm sorry. Go. Oh, manifesting work that um, is just right for me and the higher purpose that's it Dan, I wanted to ask you if you if you looked at this scenario, which was really beautiful that you described. What characteristics would you say that you needed to look for in yourself and and bring to the forefront to be able to cope and to move forward so that you could realize these gifts? What got you through? Well, my pattern is to um, in a in sort of a, a panic as a motivator, and in a panicked way to look for something that was um, in the right ballpark, but not perhaps exactly right. Now it could have been, but in my case, it was not. And I think because there was a lot of fear and and panic about what am I going to do, and um, you know what has gotten me through, truthfully, is to just continue to be honest and to say that's not quite it, and and. It's more, I need more of this and a little of that. And so it's a, it's a process of diving deeper um, and being really honest and calling up what's really me and my essence. So it's, an ongoing process and an answer to your question, um, one thing that has really helped me is um, uh, this triangle work that Amy's introduced, radiant reflective triangle work, has been really helpful in uh, diving into depths and areas that um, promoted shifts that um, have made me become more whole. Thank you. It's beautiful. Thank you.
I often think that it's sometimes, you know, when we look at people who are larger than life on the, you know, on the world stage and think about what happened to them, like Nelson Mandela, and you know, what, how was he able to get through? And he was a celebrity and people knew about him and he managed to keep going for 27 years and in a prison, in a jail, but managed to break out of it, break out of the, the prison, so to speak, while, while in it. And, you know, he would talk about it by by commandeering his own soul and taking responsibility for his for his faith. And we know this all came from an inner level. And one can imagine that that was a big gift to himself in addition to the world, really, and everyone around him. And that groups of people who have been persecuted or who endure perhaps even, you know, greater torture that are unknown, torture, imprisonment, and things that make it through really extreme forms of adversity. I'm wondering if anyone would be willing to share their thoughts about how people do that. what it is that keeps people going and what is the gift in in what they have to call up to do it. Or from your own experience. This is Deborah. Uh, I think that one way that I get through adversity is, as you mentioned earlier, trust. And I have a trust trust that things are happening in the long run, the way the way they are intended to happen. And I have a mantra uh, which. I've gotten very good at saying when I'm when I'm in a, a a dark place, and actually say it almost every day, even when I'm not in a dark place. And that is, the universe supports me, and I allow it. And when I do that, and I take a deep breath, and I realize that I don't know uh, how this is supporting me at at the current moment, just like when I was released, I certainly didn't know how that could be supporting me at all, but as my life events have unfolded in the past few months, it's clear to me that this is this is being orchestrated at a much higher level uh, than I could than my little self, than I as a personality level could orchestrate my life. Right. Thank you. I'm wondering if if everyone on the call or whoever would like to join in would take a moment to um, 
to just comment on what stays with them in their heart and their mind about this topic, even if it's just brief, if it triggered something in you or reminded you of something or supported something you already feel or believe in, even if it's just a single word, um, I would invite you to just share that as we bring this part to to a close, unless you have more than that to say. And then I think we'll have, in closing, at the end, after uh, after we do, um, we do this and give some information, we'll have a, a healing attunement as a blessing at the end. But if you would care to share just for a moment something that comes to you that stays in your heart and mind about this topic. If this would be the time to do it, and we'd appreciate it. Hello, Judy. Nancy. Can you hear me? Yep, I can. This is Thomas Ayers. Hi, Thomas. Uh, I actually have one or two little thoughts. Uh, okay. Cosmic on you here. Okay. <laughs> I believe it was Yogananda who taught me uh, something that that all circumstances conspire to lead us home to the divine. Uh, And that's both adverse circumstances and (laughs) everything else. And in thinking about this topic, it seemed to me that adversity includes not only, you might say, the the things that happen in a a day-to-day sort of environment, like tripping and falling or (laughs) slipping and landing on one's back on the ice, Uh, that there's also kind of touching in with what Deborah just suggested, that there's a bigger thing going on here, something that Roselon Breuer referred to as the uh, sacred wounding, uh, that basic fundamental energetic shift point in our early lives um, that that basically sets the character for that individual to kind of use as a springboard for the rest of their lives. Uh, all developmental schemes. Uh, Barbara Brennan's with the air five stages and the Jungian things seem to me to reflect this, this this topic, um, that it's a place to start from to find our way home to the divine. Uh, and it may be just simple things like you were saying, becoming more mindful, slowing down, being present, like Diane said, being really honest, and touching in with what Deborah said, just finding the beauty in the moment. So, So that's my my offering. Thank you. Thank you. Very beautiful. You're welcome. Nancy, it's Judy. Hi, Judy. Hi. Um, What I would like to share is that I really appreciate the affirmation for myself for for the topic this evening that um, it's giving um, credence to how I'm feeling and how I'm how I've been um, being aware of going through my life with uh, the understanding that I am not always in control and that when something goes sideways a little bit, that there's usually a very good reason. And um, in my experience, there there has been, and it can be something as simple as deciding to turn down a road and going by an accident on another road that I could have taken or um, turning around to see someone that I haven't seen in a very long time in a place where I had no intention of being that day. 
and those are the kinds of things that are not always adversities, but more awareness. I certainly have had those adversities in my life, and they, they have all um, resulted in amazing things in my life, and one of them being the path here that I'm leading with all of you. And uh, so this evening was very good for me, and I thank you very much. Thank you for sharing that. And it's interesting, as you were talking, I did, there was a theme, you know, that exists there between, you know, having those synchronies and those beautiful things happen in your life that you wouldn't call adversities, but just synchronous, you know, opportunities and adversity, which is really what Thomas was pointing out and Deborah was pointing out and Diane and all that, that underneath there is something bigger that's going on that in the guidance is referred to the flow of positive energy, you know, that which keeps us moving along in a way that ultimately supports our highest. So thank you. Very beautiful. Nancy, this is Judith. Judith. Hi, Judith. Hi. I really enjoyed this evening, and it's just given me such... um, a deep respect for the nobleness of the human spirit and how, in a way, um, looking for the gift in adversity is almost normal, you know, if we're really (laughs) conscious beings. And I just want to set a little scene for you. I'm, I'm sleeping on my sofa because my entire house is in an uproar because I'm painting everything and, and getting new floors and, and making it beautiful because I got a nice settlement from an auto accident, which was years of pain and suffering. But I I never could have done all this were it not for going through that. And I wrote a poem, which I'd like to share. It's very short. Thank you. Where do rainbows go at night? Do they move on to bring smiles of surprise and delight to other faces after other storms in other places? Or does the rainbow gently ease itself into a colorful, cuddly circle to rest and recharge after the enormous effort of producing those heavy pots of gold every day, never a break in stirring golden dreams, for there is always a storm somewhere with rainbows always close behind? Or perhaps they're still on the horizon, relaxing in darkness, invisible to us, unless we can totally imagine rainbows at night, while we dream our dreams of other storms finally passed. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. So beautiful. So thank you very much, Nancy. I enjoyed the evening and your program and your um, stories and and, uh, reflection. So I just will say I'm grateful. Thank you, Diane, and thank you for sharing. Okay. Does anyone else have anything they want to comment on, what stays with them, something in their mind or heart? Okay, well, I'd like to thank you all for joining us in the Spirit Gathering Teleconference. The call may be archived as an MP3 at www.tazadi.org. Phone access to the recording of this call is available until next month's call. For playback of the recording, dial 712-432. 1085. The access code is 990-322-POUND. And we hope you'll join us for our next spirit gathering on March 18th, 2014, in one month, literally one month from today. The topic will be laughter with Reverend Judy Myers.
These calls are hosted by Tsadi, an interspiritual metaphysical organization founded in California in 1964. Tsadi welcomes, nurtures, and supports people in celebrating and more directly experiencing their relationship with the loving presence of the divine. Our programs are open to people of any race, color, or national or ethnic origin. Visit www.sadi.org to learn more. We will close now with thanks and a blessing. Thanks to Sadi founders Amy Keith and Dorothy Blackmere. Thanks to founding bishop, uh, residing bishop Amy Skizas. Thanks to all of you who have been part of our community tonight. And thanks to the divine who support us always, even when we are not aware of it. And now I invite you to close your eyes and to settle gently into yourself in a position of relaxation and comfort. Becoming aware of the rhythm of your breathing and the beating of your heart. Bringing your awareness to the center of your chest, where your heart resides in unison with all other hearts. And imagine, if you will, a rose quartz in the center of your heart. If another mineral or gem appears there, welcome that into your heart. Maybe it's a multifaceted diamond. Or a healing amethyst. Find your crystal or your gem within your heart center. And know that this is the center of pure, unconditional love and at the same time, indestructibility. They live together within you in beauty, and in harmony with all of your molecules, all of your atoms, all of the subatomic particles which make up the greater part of who you are. And now imagine a stream of light from the heavens coming down and entering through the crown of your head, filling up your body like it was an empty container of milk, moving down to your your heels and your toes, moving down your arms to the tips of your fingers, filling your body with a healing, nurturing, and cleansing light.
bringing in all energies that are serving your highest light and your highest joy. And in the center of the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet are small small portals. And these are your exit portals where all energies that are no longer serving your highest good exit. You might see the energy leave as a smoky film or as an invisible force. And this is how it should be. The light which cleanses Move through that which serves you to release. Any pain, any negativity, any needs you have to hold on to being right or to having been wronged. Letting the part of you that feels victimized be released. We all have that. Letting the drama leave. Letting aspects of your personality that are ready to be released leave to portals. In the light which continues to or into your body brings with it a resurrection. With that resurrection, you are nurtured and energized. You are held in love and in the possibility of change, of upgrading of uplifting yourself and all others, of continually becoming better, of continually becoming more beautiful and more loving. Of being ready for more service. by loving yourself more and presenting who you are to the rest of the world. And rest for a moment as the flow of light Pass through you. Leaving its gifts within your body and your being. And clearing out those which you are ready to release. And now, very gently, return your awareness to 
to your physical body. And as you do this, keep a part of you centered in this harmonious energy. The light which comes from the far reaches of your own energy field, from the place where all of our energy fields intersect, the place of oneness. And see if you can return your awareness of your body into an integrated experience of body and spirit, upgraded and uplifted. Gently moving your wrists around. Your ankles. And eventually your head, your neck. Taking whatever time you need. And we thank you for joining us in the work of the one body of light and love. And we will wait here when you're ready to emerge. Just let us know. We can say goodbye. Just be sure to unmute. Nancy, thank you for a lovely program. Thank you for being here and contributing. Thank you, Nancy and everyone. So and nice to be you with so you. Yes. Thanks. So thank much. you all. Thank, thank you. Thank you.